Hey, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the BSV Bookathon. And so delighted to be here. And you have reached past it, writing history. I'm Sherry Lewis Wool. I'm not a historical writer. I'm a paranormal writer with BSB, but I am super happy to be here with this fantastic panel this morning. And I am delighted to introduce to you, in no particular order, uh, Morgan Lee Miller. She's a two-time Goldie finalist whose seventh novel, The Memories of Marley Rose, came out in December. She lives in Washington, D.C. with her two feline children, Milo and Elsa whom she's unapologetically obsessed with. And, you know, we're totally okay with that. Awesome. <laughs> uh, she loves all things animals, spicy foods that make her cry, and the thing she loves most, procrastinating and writing her next novel. Yeah, I think pretty much we can relate to that too. Yeah. <laughs> now, David S. Pedersen has written seven Heath Barrington and three Mason Adler mysteries, highlighting the difficulty of being gay in the 1940s. He's been nominated twice for the Lambda Literary Awards, and he's passionate about mysteries, old movies, ocean liners, and reading. He, his husband, and their sweet rescue cats reside in the sunny Southwest. Uh, Missouri Vaughn has spent a large part of her childhood in Southern Mississippi before high school in North Carolina and college in Tennessee. She spent 23 years working for newsplay papers in, in places as disparate as Chicago, Atlanta, and Jackson, Mississippi. Her novels are heartfelt, earthy, and speak of loyalty and her responsibility toward others. She currently lives in Northern California with her wife, Evelyn, and she also writes under the name of Paige Braddock. And Kate Walsh, or Kate Walsh, I don't know where that came from. Uh, Jane Walsh is a Canadian author who once upon a time studied both history and costume design. Love that, Jane, because um, I love theater. And now she puts those skills to good use by writing queer reg Regency romance novels. So welcome, everybody. Um, and before we get started, um, I just want to make a note that if you have questions, please pop those in the Q&A box and I'll try and keep an eye on those and, and see if we can put those to our esteemed panel here. And um, just another note that if you want to see all our bright, shiny faces, make sure to use the gallery view. That way you can see everyone. So now let's let the games begin. So I have a question for you all. Because we're talking history, it's about getting it right when you're writing the historical novels. And so how important is it to you to get the details right in terms of things like the dates, the locations, actual events, weathers, technology, any of that kind of thing? Um, so I'm going to start with David. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's a great question. <clears throat> to me, the details are very important. Um, I feel like if you don't get the details right, it detracts from the story. For example, if I'm writing a book set in Milwaukee in the 1940s and I refer to Wisconsin Avenue as Grand Avenue, some people may say, wait a minute, it became Wisconsin Avenue before the 1940s. So errors like that, I feel like they take the, they take the reader out of the story. And it's kind of jarring. So I prefer to be as accurate as much as I can. So the, those little details will flow by the reader, you know, much like the words he said or she said. So <clears throat> I think people, if something's not right, they pick it up, they pay attention to it, and it, it just takes them right out of the story. But if the details are correct, they just flow right by it. Great, thanks. How about you, Missouri? What do you think? Where do you fall on this? <clears throat> yeah, I definitely agree with David. Um, you don't want to, you don't want, something modern to to seep in you know and pull somebody out of the story because you're trying to immerse them in the place and time that you're writing about and um one of the things i do because most of i've only written a couple of historical fiction books and most of them are set both of them are set in the uh in kansas in the westward sort of expansion era and what i discovered doing research is that there are a ton of first person accounts so if you can read diaries from the era in which you're writing, you can get like some really authentic sort of language and, and the words people use to describe things. And also um, 
I don't know. It just adds, it, it adds an element of being in that place and time with real people. So, um, but yeah, like things like figuring out in my case in the 1850s, how could you take a train to the West? No. Could you, you know, how did you get places? Like, how did you, how, was there coffee? Like really mundane things that you don't think about. You can really go down the, in, you know, down the rabbit hole of researching uh, what people's daily lives were like in those eras. Great, thank you. Hey, Morgan, where what are, where are you at on this one? Well, speaking of rabbit holes, I <laughs> fell down a lot of them when writing Marley Rose. And I think the small details are extremely important. I probably put a little too much importance on the little details. Like there's a scene in Marley Rose, there's a specific date and I wanted to get the weather right. So I had to Google the dates. Like, I think it was like December 19th and 1962 in New York. And I wanted that weather, not like anyone would know, but I would know. Um, so I fell down a couple of rabbit holes and making sure that my characters were drinking the right beers because not all the beers were around during that time. So I even have this forgot what the beer is called it's literally one line but talking about a beer that was made in Brooklyn in the 1970s I'm like she'll drink that and I think it's just those little details that really enhance the story um I was a huge fan of the movie The Notebook when I was a teenager and I remember on the internet somewhere someone said you can see parking meters in the background and there were no parking meters in the 1940s and that kind of just stuck with me so when I, and I've only written one historical book but that really stuck with me I'm like I will fall down these rabbit holes to make sure no one's like hey that parking meter shouldn't have been there great thank you so Jane now we get into Regency and I have to think that this is particularly important for the Regency genre because those readers really know what's going on. I would say yes and no. So I, I think it's a really interesting question because I have never, it's never occurred to me to say April 29, 1810, what was the weather? What was the moon phase? Was there cloud cover? I've never thought about that in that detail. I know that there are Regency authors that create almanacs for themselves that actually have a day by day, month by month, year by year, schedule on all of these different events like historical events like what bills of parliament were passed meteorological things I think that's really interesting because I've never I've never thought about things like the weather patterns or that kind of detail I do think it's important to have you know like what kind of clothing they wore like what like as Morgan said like what did they drink what did they eat like were matches invented yet like there are definitely things that you have to pay attention to but I think I think it's important. I also think it's not so important to put all of your research into the book because it bogs down the narrative. And you have to be careful about what you want to include to give texture and to give authenticity and believability and interest. But there's also, you have to make sure that you're not putting in so much that people think like, wow, like I'm reading like a, you know, a five page pamphlet on, you know, how they made bread you know, because that's not necessarily interesting to the reader. So you kind of have to know what to put in and what, and what to take away. I do end up researching, I think most of all, turns of phrases, like etymology, like when did certain phrases originate and why? Um, and I feel like I am constantly going through my manuscript going like, okay, like, um, please does punch, like, where does that come from? And it comes actually from Punch and Judy, which was like a long-standing British tradition from like the 1500s. So I can put that into my Regency. Like there's definitely things like that where, um, yeah, it's really interesting to have an eye to those details, but I, can, I do find that you can have too much. Thanks. And you know, you brought up a good point. Well, two things, moon phases, which for me as a paranormal writer, I actually have researched phases of the moon, but you know, that's a whole different thing. <laughs> But you talk about the etymology and I'm wondering, you know, and, and for you in the Regency genre, it is important. And I'm wondering from the rest of the panel, how does that play into what you're writing as well? Morgan? I, I didn't go as in depth as Jane, but obviously I wanted to make sure that I was using some slang 
but I didn't want to overdo on the slang. Like there's only so many groovies you can have when it takes place in the 60s and 70s. I think I have one groovy. I'm like, oh, that's enough. But when I was writing and my story takes place really from the early 60s to now, um, I had a sheet of, or a tab open of 60s slang, 70s slang, and trying to just pepper in just a bit but not overdoing it because again, if you're constantly reading groovy or rad or whatever they were saying in the sixties, it's gonna kind of take away from the narrative, but it's definitely important to research how people were talking. Love it, love it. Missouri, how about you? I think, um, you know, I, like I was saying, I, reading people's diaries, you you kind of get a, a real feel for how people actually talk to each other and talked about things and how they describe things. And But one of the things I have really learned writing books set in the 1850s is our modern language that we use to describe gender did not exist. And the minute you start using any of that language, um, like there's a really great, uh, there was a really great book, uh, uh, nonfiction called, um, I think the title is Redressing the American West um, that a professor wrote about just about gender in the 1800s and sort of how how we talk about gender evolved. Um, so anyway, I'm always really careful to not modernize that. And in both of my books, I have a female character who dresses as a man. And honestly, in that era, if you just put on guys clothes, people just assumed you're a guy. Nobody even like talked about, you know, the way we talk about the sort of continuum of gender now. So I don't know, that's just an interesting puzzle to solve when you're writing books like that. Um, it's just funny that people had very clear roles and expectations, you know, if you were a man or a woman, but all you had to do was change clothes. And then you were like, considered this other person. It was a funny thing. Love and people were very remote from each other. So you didn't get in people's personal spaces. People didn't share uh, really intimate knowledge about themselves with strangers or even sometimes with neighbors. So it was more easy to be in disguise or to, you know, choose a path that maybe was non-traditional. Anyway, just figuring out all that kind of stuff is really fun when you're working on these stories. Love it. Love it. How about you, David? Oh, sure. Absolutely. Phrasing is very important. Um, I know in some of my books, I would use phrases and, and my, my editor, Jerry, uh, would catch them for me, thankfully. I'm very thankful for him, for Jerry Wheeler. Uh, like saying, bud, like, hey, bud. He was like, that really wasn't a phrase in the 1940s. And so it was, hey, buddy was fine, but not hey, bud. So I definitely try to pay attention to those types of things and make sure that they fit the story. And it's been fascinating to do the research and, and find phrases back then that people use that people don't often use today and vice versa. So I think phrasing goes along with all those little details. You have to make sure that you have it correct or it's jarring. I had another example where I was watching an old movie in the 1920s and somebody said thank you to that person. And the response was no problem. And I was like, they didn't say that back in the 1920s. So as, as somebody watching this, I was, I was taken out of the story myself because it was, it was jarring. I'm like, that, that shouldn't be the case. So phrasing is definitely important. So I'm gonna kind of piggyback off of that and, and ask you how you handle your research and if you have any good resources that you could share with us. Yeah, absolutely. Um, obviously, I do a lot of Google. Um, <laughs> I'm sure everybody uses Google a lot, but you, I found that my husband's a retired school librarian, uh, so he helps a lot as well. And I found that you can't just rely on Google uh, or Wikipedia because they're not always accurate and they're not always detailed. So I do use the library um, quite a bit. We have a really good library system here in Phoenix. And <clears throat> there's a, several other resources I enjoy as well. Uh, I know um, I know the weather was mentioned, and there is a really good source for that uh, that I use. It's the old Farmers Farmers Almanac online, and they can you can go back quite a ways. Um, I think at least into the 1920s, where they kept weather records. 
And yeah, you don't want to put, as you mentioned, you don't want to put every little detail in the book, but it's good, at least for the authors, to know what was going on at that time period if you're writing about a blizzard or a snowstorm. So that's kind of handy to have that kind of detail. And an online newspaper archives. And I really liked, I think it was uh, Missouri who mentioned the, uh, the old journals. I think that's a fascinating idea. I haven't researched those yet, but I definitely will look that up as well. And as I said, the online newspaper archives are a uh, treasure trove of information. Great, thank you. How about you, Jane? How do you um, handle research? I also definitely Google. There's a, there's a lot of Regency authors, like it's a huge, huge genre um, in romance. And there's a lot of authors that have blogs where they'll write like a blog entry and then very helpfully they'll put their secondary source or primary source research kind of at the bottom like to cite their sources so it can be good to um get a jump start on where to look and then you get you know the you can look at the actual citation and, and get a deeper dive into what you need research on so google is definitely helpful um there's an online scholarly database called jstor which i used to use all the time when i was in uh, university studying history and jstor is a collection of scholarly articles and primary sources that um, to get the full use of it, you should belong to a library or a school where you would have access to it. But as a free user, any one of you can join up by yourself by email and you get access to 100 free articles per month. And there are certain things behind like a paywall, like you can't download articles without paying like a $35 fee, like that kind of thing. But the amount of um, access that you do have as a free user is you know, extraordinary. So I highly, highly recommend JSTOR to anyone looking for those things. And also, I have a personal contract with myself that I can only purchase one research book per contract that I sign with Bold Strokes Books. <laughs> That's a good <laughs> rule. to limit myself <laughs> from going nuts <laughs> and buying whatever I want. So some of the examples that I've bought for myself over the years, I, I do have a book of Regency slang, um, which is really interesting. For my current series, The Spinsters of Inverley, I bought the Georgian seaside because uh, my books are set in like this seaside resort town on the south coast of England. And this was a great resource. Like it had a lot of details about how much you would pay um, to, to rent a boarding house for like a weekend if you were going to the seaside, like really interesting details. And my favorite resource that I bought for myself was probably the Epicure's Almanac, where this is basically a guy in 1815 walked the streets of London and wrote a review. It's basically a Yelp review collection of this guy's visits to every bar and tavern and watering hole that he could find. And it's this huge, huge book where he just has so many details of different places he went to. And he had like a lot of scathing commentary. Like he would say things like, oh, the crown and bore in, where all the lawyers go, you must, you must um, not go there. <laughs> like it's a very boring place with all the lawyers. So it's a fascinating, fascinating primary source analysis of like where to go to eat and what they would eat, that kind of thing. So anyway, I love research. I could probably talk for another 20 minutes. So that's, those are my main, those are my main sources. Those are fantastic, Jane. And, and can I just have to add a little note on the JSTOR because uh, my master's thesis was on, on the 1872 vampire story, Carmilla. Okay. And I was doing research one time and my thesis popped up as one of the sources on there. And I'm oh, like, wow. oh. I was all excited. <laughs> that is I don't highlight. know if anybody ever used it, but it was pretty exciting. That's people do, good. people do, because I my next book, I just signed a contract for a book that I'm publishing in about a year, and it's about um there's some stuff in there about like the glove making business of the 19th century. And I was doing research and I found somebody's master's thesis on glove making in the 19th century. And I totally read her thesis. It was published in like 1995. And I was like, I wonder if this person has any idea that somebody is still using that research. Like it's definitely, people are accessing it, Sherry. People are reading it. Yeah, well, it was fun. It made my day. So, yeah, hey, Ms. Gary, how about you on this one? How do you handle research? Uh, I have a very good friend who's a librarian who who said that some days her job gets really boring. And so any weird questions I can send her that she can research, she's very happy to help. Um, she, she will usually find, I'm just not very good at research. I don't know. I don't know what my problem is, but she can find like these newspaper articles that are pertinent to things I'm looking for. And um, a lot of sources that I probably wouldn't be able to find myself. 
Um, but I was going to say, it's interesting because you sort of need, um, I'm sure everybody kind of agrees with this. You sort of need sources from every sort of tier of society. Right. So like I, I'm from the South, so I like, I am sort of drawn to these characters who migrated West because they were really struggling and they were trying to make a better life for themselves. So you're not going to get the flavor of their experience if you only read like a newspaper article or scholarly research. You really do need to read something more um, of somebody's day-to-day -day life about uh, how they lived, you know, how they got food, what they ate. Um, I don't know. I think it, I'm just, I guess I'm talking about socioeconomic sort of uh, perspectives at, at any given time in history. I find that kind of interesting too. Um, but yeah, library libraries are awesome. And I also have to limit myself because I go down these rabbit holes of research and I was like, oh, I really need that book. And I've had to stop doing that. Um, I just, because you, I only have so much, this is not, this is like a backyard writing shed and I only have so much shelf space back here. So I can't go too crazy. Um, oh, thanks, thanks. How about you, Morgan? I don't have really anything new to add. I love Google. Google's my best friend. And so that was probably my main source. I can't remember any particular website name. I I say that I read the whole internet. Well, it feels like the whole internet. Um, I watched a lot of YouTube because there's, you can find any kind of little documentary on anything I was looking for on YouTube. Um, and a lot of stuff I kind of just asked my parents. A lot of these like nitty gritty details, like what kind of beer were you drinking in the seventies? I don't know. And just like these little things, what did you do for fun? What shows were you watching? And it's like those little details I got from my parents. And so that was really helpful too. I love it. I love it. Yeah. When you were talking about groovy, when I was a little kid, people used that term a lot. And I still find myself doing it today because it makes me laugh. <laughs> It does make me laugh. I wrote it. And I'm like, oh, I can't really take this line seriously, but they really did use Groovy. And I was a big fan of the Brady Bunch. I love the Brady Bunch. And they oh, use yeah. Groovy a lot. I'm like, if Marsha Brady can say Groovy a lot yep. in the Brady Bunch, I can use it just once. Yep. I still say Groovy. I still say Groovy. <laughs> they should bring Groovy back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's my response a lot of times to emails is groovy and like say it just makes me laugh. So I it is a it. funny word. Yeah. Yeah. It is. And and Morgan, interestingly, um I do a lot of I used to actually. I used to know these two old older gentlemen, my husband and I back in Wisconsin, and they were both in their nineties. They they'd been a couple for sixty years. And I I used to love talking to them too and getting first hand accounts of what it was like to be gay back in the 1940s and they had some amazingly fascinating and, oh, and sure. sometimes, sometimes funny stories so yeah that's an awesome in person is always a great resource too yeah you. harder and harder so, to find it, it is and it really um it really speaks to the lack of resources that we actually do have like as queer people like there are so many letters and diaries and personal accounts that were burnt or destroyed by family members like after people had past like a lot of those resources are actually lost to us so we don't have necessarily the full scope of what it was like to be queer like in those um previous decades because it was so heavily stigmatized that um even like surviving relatives like would not have those materials in their house like it was really primary sources like primary sources are really like what gives us the knowledge and talking to those people directly is amazing but unfortunately like we only have access to those people that are still surviving. Exactly. And all the more props to you guys for doing this work with the, the limited resources that you do have and making these stories so great. So that leads me into the next question, which is why write historical rather than contemporary? Um, David, I see you right front and center. So I'm gonna start with you. Sure. Yes, uh, all my books are set in the mostly in the 1940s. There's one in the 1930s, and I get asked that question a lot. Why did you choose that time period? Why do you why do you choose historical at all? And I guess the best answer to that is I grew up watching all those old movies that were set in the 1930s and 1940s, and I just loved them. I loved the era. I loved the clothes. I loved the cars. I loved the language, the dialogue. And 
As much as I love them, though, there were very few, if any, LGBTQ plus characters in them. And if there were in these movies, they were usually comic sidekicks or tragic figures with unhappy lives. And you know, it's like, oh my gosh, if you're, the, the, the subtext was if you're gay, you're, you're gonna lead a miserable life and your life is gonna end up in tragedy. So as I grew older, I realized that really wasn't the case. I wanted to show through my writing that LGBTQ plus people have always been here. They've always been around. They've just often been in the shadows and frequently doing extraordinary things. And so through the writing, I just wanted to show that LGBTQ characters are just ordinary people who happen to be gay. Great. I love that. Thank you. How about you, Jane? Why Regency? Um, I think a large part of it is that the first romance I ever read was a historical romance. This was 30 years ago. It was Joe Beverly's My Lady Notorious, which was strictly Georgian. But any of that kind of historical romance, I just absolutely fell in love with. I thought it was amazing. And I knew from like the first year that I was reading romance, I knew that I wanted to write historicals and publish them. Like it's been this lifelong dream and I'm so grateful to have the opportunity to do that now. Um, so I, I never had any other dream for publishing. <laughs> like I always knew it would be historicals. I never even thought about writing contemporaries. And I don't know if I have one in me. I think the research to do a contemporary novel is actually a lot more daunting because unless I wrote a novel about my personal um, experience, like my workplace, the city I live in, like I think I'd have to do so much research if I was writing, you know, a firefighter and an accountant. I'd be like, I don't, I don't know anything about those things. And the amount of research I'd have to do for that is more daunting to me than researching historical um, events or places or, or jobs for some reason. I just, I don't have it, I don't have, I don't have the interest in me, I guess, for writing contemporaries. I like that you write to the heart. Yes. Uh, how about you, Missouri? Uh, I was just sitting here thinking about that question. I, I've actually, I've written 22 books. I think I just turned in my 22nd manuscript and only three of them are historical fiction. And I think one one is set in the 30s and it's basically based on family lore about uh, moonshiners in the uh, Blue Ridge Mountains of North Georgia. So that I just talked to a lot of family members to uh, research that book. And then the other two, I think this these ones that are set um, in the 1850s are inspired by me watching a million Westerns with my dad and just being really into that period of American history. Um but as David said, there's like no representation of what was going on for uh, queer people in that era, right? But you can read these newspaper articles that were written about women captured, you know, disguised as men who had, you know, married other women. And it's so funny to read those filtered through that journalist perspective of why these people were doing it. And I'm thinking, because they were in love. That's why they were doing it, right? So reclaiming some of these sort of misunderstood figures from that era and, and giving them the love story they didn't get, right? That's what these books are about. Um, it was just really fun. And the stuff I wish I had seen as a young person watching these Westerns with my dad, you know, someone like myself represented in those stories. Because we, no, we know we were there, right? We know that we were there. We just, you know, we're in the background. Yeah. It was sort of like we've talked about um, in Star Wars for me as a young person watching Princess Leia and the first time I'd ever seen that kind of representation of a woman in power. Yes, and exactly. Yeah. Changed the way you looked at things. That was that was a turning moment for me. So when Morgan, she takes, when she takes that gun away from Luke, you're like, yes, it was. I had never seen anything like it. And it really I walked out of there going, yeah. <laughs> Groovy. So Morgan, jump to you. Yeah, groovy. <laughs> groovy. I, so I've only written one historical book and I think it will probably stay that way for a little bit, but it was really fun to change it up a bit. And it just worked well with the idea of my story, Marley Rose, about a woman who wants to erase her memories. And so we have to go back in time to show her life as to why she wants to erase these memories. 
Um, but I've always been interested in the 1960s and 70s, like so much happened. And I think a lot of that comes from my parents. Um, I think my mom is probably as nostalgic as I am. So I got to hear like a lot of her stories. And back in my day, this is what we used to do. And I would find it fascinating because her life as a boomer, so much different than my life as a millennial. And I like one of my favorite TV shows is The Wonder Years. And that takes place in the 60s and 70s. It's also very nostalgic. And when I was a teenager into college, I wrote a story that took place in the 60s. So like I loved all the research and I really like learning about that time. And um, I mean, that book will never get published. That's, you know, a practice book. But I always wanted to revisit that time. And I got to explore a little bit in this book. And yeah, again, I'm a, I'm a nostalgic person. I also like, am like one of those kids. I'm like, I kind of wish I grew up during that time. Um, it sounds really fun. And so that's why I chose that. Um, I'm just really interested in all that history, the modern history. And we didn't really get to talk about that modern history in school. It was always, you know, about the 1700s, 1800s. And I wanted to learn about World War II, Vietnam, um, and we didn't really talk about that. So it's just kind of taking in my parents' experiences and wanting to learn more and then getting ideas in my head. And I like what Missouri said about giving that story or giving the story or the ending that those characters deserve. And we don't see that a lot. And so that was really cool. It was really groovy to write that in to uh, my book of getting those, giving those characters this love story with the happy, happily ever after. Nice. nice. It's funny you talk about different eras, Morgan, because I, I, I have, I work with a diverse age group and I always tell my millennial friends, Hey man, the seventies were great. I was there. That's what my mom said. She's like, Oh, that was such a groovy time. Like it sounds so cool. <laughs> yeah. I was there too, Missouri. It was fun. Good times. Good times. <laughs> <laughs> and we won't go into any more detail than that. Yeah. So. Fair enough. Okay. Another question for you all. So how do you feel? So we've talked about getting all the details right and, and all of those things, but how do you feel about twisting fictionalized historical accounts? And, and what I'm getting at is things like, think about James Cameron's Titanic, where he takes a real event and throws in uh, fictional characters. Or what I do in my paranormals, and I've done it in a number of books, is I take historical characters and put them in fictionalized settings. And so how does how do you guys feel about authors that do that, or not necessarily the authors, but how do you feel about the stories that do that? And would you do it? Missouri, you're front and center here, so I'm going with you. Yeah, I think I'm too nervous to take some well-known documented character and do that. So I like do the characters that I imagine are on the fringe of those sort of uh historical events you know um yeah i probably don't trust my research enough to do an established historical figure and then retell their story although that's a really that would be an interesting that's an interesting idea to do that um yeah yeah i don't know if i'm brave enough or i'm just dumb enough to go yeah let's do this so <laughs> <laughs> morgan how about you I'm going to go off of what Missouri said. I don't really, I love research, but I also don't like trust my research to take on an actual historical character. But um, I do, I did do research of people in, so this Marley Rose, the main character is on Broadway. And so I did take, I researched some um, famous Broadway singers and try to kind of model her career after a couple people. Um, but then I really had a lot of fun tying in actual events to the book, like Stonewall and the 1977 blackout in New York. That plays a huge part in this story, the AIDS epidemic. So there were actual historical events that were in this story. And that was really fun to uh, write. Um, but yeah. Super. Thanks. David, how about you? Oh, yes. <clears throat> the blackout in New York. Where were you when the lights went out? Yes. I remember that. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's, it's interesting because that's, that's a fascinating question there because there are kind of two sides to it or two parts to it. There's, there's taking 
true life historical figures and putting them in a fictional setting. And then there's taking fictional characters and putting them in a real life historical event. And, and I, that's your, to use your example, that's what James Cameron did with Titanic. He took the characters of Jack and Rose and put them on the Titanic, which obviously was a real event, but Jack and Rose were completely fictional. And he did it so well that people actually think Jack and Rose were on that ship. And they weren't, it was totally fictional. Uh, personally, I like it better with something like the Hindenburg or the Titanic if they leave those characters out because the story itself is so fascinating to me. Um, a Titanic movie that I really enjoyed was A Night to Remember, and that was based on the book. And I thought that did a fantastic job of telling the narrative without delving into the fiction. But Titanic was a great movie, and it certainly did really well. Um, as far as bringing fictional characters into my books, or, or real life characters into my books, I do that on occasion, but they are, like Missouri said, they're usually background background figures in my books. I, I don't, uh, I, like, I wouldn't write any any real life character into my book as a major character. Great. You know what's funny? Can I just say this about the Titanic movie? It, what's funny to me about that is uh, how swept away everyone got with that romance between those two characters, right? Even though we all knew how the movie was going to end, right? And exactly. it was funny. I just, I have this memory of being in the theater and this woman sitting next to me was handing her friend the box of Kleenex and saying, uh, here, you might need these. I hear it's really sad. And I go, yeah, the boat sinks. Everybody dies. Like we already know that going in, like, and they still managed to do this riveting romance story. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I just had to share that little anecdote. <laughs> That's a good point. That was a good one. Yeah. Yeah. So Jane, how about you? <clears throat> Excuse me. I, I think this is a really interesting question. And I think it's a really important one. Like when I was studying history, I briefly considered going into uh, museum curatorship. And there's a lot of kind of discussion about how, um, how you would get the public interested in the historical viewpoints that you want to present. And I think it's important to remember that as authors, like we are entertainers, like we are creating something for public consumption that we hope will entertain. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean that it's like 100% all up and like everything is great and like nothing bad ever happens, but but it is, it's, it's entertainment. And putting, when you put real life characters into the narrative, I think there's such great potential for the public to get interested and to learn about it. Like I remember I was a teenager when Titanic came out. My sister was one of those girls that went to see it 10 times in theater. Like we were definitely a Titanic household. <laughs> And I remember at school, then we did like a unit on the Titanic and issues like in that era. And like, I feel like it did spark like a lot of interest in people about, you know, early 19th, uh, early 20th century history. And that's a great vehicle in which to do it is to have something like a book or a movie or a documentary or something like that, that sparks interest. And I think you can do that with great effect to have real life characters, like real life people that you insert into the narrative. Um, it gives a lot of dimension and texture to what you're doing. I don't know that I would do it either, but I wouldn't rule it out. Like I know there's a lot of Regency authors that have done that kind of thing. Um, Georgette Hare, who kind of originated the Regency genre back in the 20s to 60s, she was kind of famous for her, for her um, research skills and she, bought a letter that the Duke of Wellington wrote. And then she put the Duke of Wellington, um, who is like a major early 19th century figure, into her book. And she only used the words that he himself had written. So she could say that, that every word that she put into her book was exactly what he actually did say. Like those are words that really came from his mind, like essentially from his mouth. And it's just really interesting to think about. Like, I don't know if I would ever do that. You know, like, I, I just think it's interesting that people have done it. And I think there's a lot of value to doing it. No, I, I think that's a good point. I really do, Jane. And it's, uh, and it, history's fluid. I mean, you think it's, you think it's always one way, but it, it actually changes depending on people's perspectives and, and what they learn. Uh, you know, 
Cary Grant is a, is a famous example. There's so much written about him and so many movies produced about him, and yet there's still a lot that's speculative and people don't really know. And I think back to the very first Cary Grant movie I watched uh, based on, um, on a composer's life, and that was Night and Day. And, and they made that composer out to be totally different than he really was in real life. And yet it got you interested in that life story. And, and the same thing with Cary Grant. I just watched a, a biography on him himself, and it was completely different than a lot of things I'd read about him in the past. So, yeah, it's, it's an interesting way to look at history, but it is hopefully gets people interested in learning more. I agree. I like that about it, too. If it sparks, like Jane said, if it sparks that interest, I think that's a wonderful thing. So, okay, I have, I have one last question before I get to, hopefully, if we have time, some speed fire questions. But if you were going to write in a genre other than historical, what would it be? Morgan? Can you repeat that question? Yeah. If you were to write in a genre besides historical, what would that genre be? And we're probably not counting romance. Is that correct? Romance is fine. Okay. Well, I'm going to have to pick romance because that's what I usually, that's all my stories are romance. But if we take romance out, one day I hope to pull off a dystopian. I don't know if I'm quite there yet. I need to do a lot of more reading of dystopian novels, but if I could pull off a dystopian novel, that would be cool. I started one for fun, but then like it started becoming real because, you know, 2020, 2016, I'm like, oh, we're going to take a break from this. But um, when that doesn't hurt as much anymore, I would like to pick it back up and finish that. Oh, interesting. That's really interesting. So how about you, Jane? If it wasn't Regency, what would it be? Well, if, if, if it wasn't Regency, but I could still pick historical, <laughs> then I would probably pick medieval. I think there's a lot of great potential for like a sapphic medieval romance. I know there are authors writing that, but I, I think that's a very fascinating time period. And I would absolutely love to have the time to do more research to, to set one back there. If I can't choose historicals at all, then I think that's a really hard question because... I think I would go with fantasy. I think I would I would just try to avoid contemporaries altogether and I would go to something where I could I could make things up to see what I needed to do. So fantasy. Yeah, I always said I wanted to write with George R. R. Martin and learn to do the fantasy like he does, because it fascinates me and I so can't do it. <laughs> the world building is really interesting. You know, I think that's you want to really is. what would really hook me is the world building. Yeah. Yeah. Missouri, I mean, I know you you write in a bunch of different ones, but where where would you go? Well, I just it's funny on the heels of this uh, his, this historical romance, I wrote um, the manuscript I just turned in is about a um, burnout demon hunter who falls for a newbie vampire who doesn't believe that vampires are real. And uh so I had wanted to write a paranormal, but I think what I really like, I have a post-it note on my on, on my studio wall that says, write a science fiction trilogy. I really want to return to science fiction, which is kind of where my book started. Um, I love sci-fi and I want to do, you know, it's like once you build the world though, you want to write more than one book in it, right? So, cause that's kind of complicated, but anyway, that's life goals. You know, I've never written sci-fi, but I grew up on that. My brothers read all sci-fi, so I read everything they had, and I read all the classics. It's it's fun. It's fun. So how about you, David? Well, if my husband had his way, I would write sci-fi, too. <laughs> <laughs> He's a huge sci-fi guy, and, and, and I, I enjoy sci-fi. In fact, it kind of ties into your previous question that Star Trek has, strangely enough, used a lot of historical people in their shows, if you ever watch them, I mean, they brought in people like Amelia Earhart. So <laughs> it's fascinating. Um, but I think I would really, and it's funny you ask, I'm actually writing a contemporary novel right now. It's still a mystery, uh, but it is contemporary set in 2024. And that's, that's a current project I'm working on. And I decided to do contemporary just as a little bit of a change of pace. And I thought it would be kind of fun um, and it definitely has some more challenges to it 
as far as writing a mystery goes, because there is a lot of things that you have to take into account that you didn't have to back in the 40s, like DNA testing and cell phones and all those kinds of things. Like you can't really put people in a house and, and have the phone line cut and have them suddenly cut off from all civilization because of that, because everybody has a cell phone. So there's a lot more to think about in writing contemporary, but yeah, definitely. Yep. Yeah, there really yeah. is. Mm -hmm. um, I feel fortunate. I, I was search and rescue for a long time, so I have a lot of law enforcement friends. And and so they help me with things like DNA questions. And so it is good to know people. And librarians are good to have for friends, too. Yes, yes. Indeed. And husbands. <laughs> and, yes, and husbands. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so... I have a few little rapid fire questions for you just for fun, just for fun to make this easy, especially because we're, um, you know, like I'm going to start with you, David, because of your, uh, your books and everything. This seemed appropriate to me. Whiskey or wine? <laughs> oh, that's a tough choice. Uh, wine wins with dinner and a nice whiskey afterward. Uh, but <laughs> um, those two, yeah, I like them both. Although, give me, uh, a good, give me a good martini and I'm even happier. Oh, okay. You're cheating. You're cheating. Hey, Morgan, <laughs> whiskey or wine? If it's a whiskey cocktail, I'm taking the whiskey cocktail. If it's straight whiskey, I'm not strong enough to do that, so I'd have to pick wine. <laughs> <laughs> Missouri. I'm going to cheat and say hard cider. That's my favorite right now. <laughs> you guys. But I do you love guys. a good red wine. I do love a good red wine. Yeah, you and me both. Yep, yep. Hey, Jane, how about you? Not a hard question at all. No whiskey, wine all the way, Pinot Grigio, nicely chilled. Hey, yep, yep. You know, I live in wine country here up in Eastern Washington. So yeah, wine for me. All right, next one, tent or a hotel? Jane? Hotel, 1000%. No tents, not ever, I hate them. <laughs> Morgan? A hotel, I'm too much of a princess. I like my air conditioning and my comfort, yeah. <laughs> David? A oh, hotel, hands down. A camper I could do, but my tent days are behind me. I need a bathroom nearby. <laughs> <laughs> Missouri. Um, I grew up, my dad was a forester, a forest ranger. So I grew up backpacking and camping my whole life. So definitely a hotel. I've done, I've done the tent long enough. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm in the same boat after all the years of doing it and search and rescue and sleeping on sides of mountains with my dog. I like hotels. Okay, final one. Movies or the theater? Jane. Uh, the theater, the theater. I think there's something really lovely about live theater. There is. David. Oh, definitely live theater. We, we are uh, seasoned subscribers to Phoenix Theater. Nothing like a, like a troupe of live performance. Nice, nice. Missouri. Movies, that's where all the sci-fi lives. <laughs> that's true. It was true. Morgan. Picking movies. Nice, nice. I love movies, but as an actor, I love theater. So, okay, final quickie. Tell us real quickly about um, either your latest release or what you have coming up. David? My latest release, Murder <laughs> at the Oasis, uh, set in Palm Springs, 1946, Mason Adler mystery. It's a lot of fun. Uh, check it out for sure. And as I say, I'm working on a couple new things in the pipeline. So I'll watch for those this year. Uh, Jane. My latest release is The Secret Duchess. It just came out this month, January 2024. Um, it's the last of my spinsters of Inverly series. They can all be read as standalones. Um, this one is about a fashionable spinster and a widowed duchess. Uh, Missouri. Uh, uh, the book that's out most recently is called Forever's Promise. Um, it's the one I was talking about set in the 1850s. But the one that I just turned in that'll be coming out soon is called Sacred Ground. The one about the uh, newbie vampire and who falls for the demon hunter. Oh, you know, I'm going to love that because vampires and demon hunters are right up my alley. There's so. even a werewolf in it, too. So, oh, oh, and, oh yeah, we do love our werewolves. Um, Morgan, how about you? So my latest release is The Memories of Marley Rose. This came out in December, and it's about a Broadway legend named Marley Rose, who um, in present day wants to erase painful memories. 
And so while she erases her painful memory, she recalls them. So we go back in time to as early as I think the 60s, early 60s, and we see her life and she will be erasing some of those memories. Oh, oh, I like that. That is really good. So I love going back in time to yeah, time travel sort of floats my boat. So anyway, I think they're going to cut us off in a few minutes, I think. So um, I just wanted to thank you all for talking with us today because this has been a lot of fun. And I, I don't know about everybody else, but I've learned a lot about you guys. And that, that was super fun for me. And I thank all the people that have been listening to us for the last almost hour. Um, I want to remind folks that BSB is having a uh, flash sale on the books. And so um, please jump over. Sandy put the link in the chat window so you can see, you know, it gives you a direct link to it. And you can go to uh, boldstrokesbooks.com and all the books in 2023 that were that were published in 2023 are on sale. And so you want to make sure and hit all of those too and pick up great reads by these authors and everyone else in the BSB family. Uh, so we're wishing you all a happy Sunday. And if anybody else, any, oh, there, we did have one question, I guess. Let me see. Oh, he wants to, or Joan wanted to know how well historical fiction sells compared to other genres. I don't know if anybody has an answer to that. I mean, I don't, I really don't. For me, I don't look at what everyone else is doing. It's more like, what am I doing? <laughs> I don't know if that's true for everybody else. Yeah, I would, I would think each genre has its own audience. So Yeah, yeah. And, and that's sort of what I look at, too, is that the, that the people who love historicals buy the historicals, the people who love the paranormals buy the paranormals, and it's comparing apples and oranges. So you have to write what you love. And I think what we've seen here today is you're all writing what you love, and it shows in your work. And so that is fantastic. So... If there's anything else until Sandy cuts us off that anyone wants to share. Just want to say thank you, Sherry. Great job. I really enjoyed it. And, and thank you to all the rest of the panelists and everybody watching. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Yep. This has been a lot of fun. <laughs>